Our first scripture lesson comes from 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 17. But we always must thank God for you, brothers and sisters who are loved by God. This is because you chose, he chose you from beginning to be the first crop of the harvest. This brought salvation through your dedication to God by the Spirit and through your belief in the truth. God called all of you through our good news so that you could possess the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that we taught you. Whether we taught you in person or through our letter, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and a good hope. May he encourage your hearts and give you strength in every good thing you do or say. Our second scripture lesson comes from Luke 1, 5 through 15 and verse 18. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in their years. Once, when he was serving as a priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I know that all of this will happen? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in her years. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Today, on the first Sunday of Advent, we walked into church captivated by the bright lights and the beautiful decorations, ready for the beauty of the holiday season to unfold around us. The first candle of the Advent wreath glows before us, spreading hope to all who see it. The Apostle Paul writes on hope in 2 Thessalonians, Our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loved us and gave us eternal comfort and a good hope. But hope is a tricky thing. While on one hand, hope can be one thing that carries us during a difficult season, and in those cases, hope is like a precious resource needed to be protected at all costs. But also, on the other hand, to hope for something means you first have to acknowledge things are not as they should be. To hope for something means to go into a vulnerable place as you look towards the future, hoping for the best, while oftentimes preparing for the worst. To hope for something is to long for it, not knowing for sure if it will happen or not. Kate Bowler, professor at Duke and... Um, who has written several books about her experience living with stage four cancer, puts it this way. Hope is a tricky word for people with really hard problems. 
Zachariah and Elizabeth knew hard problems. The beginning of the Christmas story found in Luke 1 is the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth. Zachariah, this faithful priest, and Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, mother of Jesus, who is aged in her years, who both stand before the Lord blameless, Scripture tells us, but never have children of their own. While we don't get much of a backstory on them, I can imagine the societal pressure on them to have this children. The judgment placed on them for their lack of offspring, notice the scripture has to tell us, but they're blameless. It's not their fault. And I can imagine the personal hope that they held that one day it would finally be their turn. That was a really hard problem only made harder when the day came that they realized their hope had completely faded, when they realized their time had passed, for they were now too old. But God made a way for the impossible. To send the one who would prepare for way the for the Christ. God sent word to them explaining Elizabeth would bear a son who's to be named John. I loved how we'll put it, to be Jesus' hype man. The angel tells him, your prayers have been heard. All along, your prayers were heard. There will be great joy and rejoicing at the birth of your son. There's hope once again. But Zechariah's response, how can I know this will happen? How can I know? And then goes on to say why this is preposterous. He asks this because of all the experiences he's had. He knows the vulnerable place that hope can put a person. He knows the risk in letting this hope become real. At times, I find people resist hope because we somehow feel if we don't acknowledge that we're really hoping for something to happen, that if it doesn't happen, we won't have so far to fall. The disappointment somehow won't be as big. But that's rarely the truth. He knows what's at stake if this hope fails. Hope at times can be light and the thing that carries us. Hope can also be heavy. So Zechariah asks, how can I know this will happen? A question seeking certain hope. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians that through Jesus, God gives us eternal comfort and a good hope. Through the Advent season and well into our Christmas celebrations, we will sing of tidings of comfort and joy. But for there to be a need for comfort, we know there must be an aching, an aching of heart and body or in the world. If all was well, there would be no need for comfort. Christ was not sent because all was already merry and bright. Christ is born to us who are weary, to us who are in need of such eternal comfort, who are craving a good hope, a certain hope. You see, Advent is a beautiful season sandwiched in the now and the not yet. Now... Or in a few short weeks, we will proclaim the good news. Christ, our Savior, is born unto us. Christ has been born and we celebrate this. We sit in the now because Christ has already come. But also not yet, because when we look at the world, we recognize it is not yet as God intended it to be. There's a hopeful tension in this place where we find ourselves between the now and the not yet, between all that has been and all that will be. In this place, 
there is so much left to discover about God's faithfulness. Kate Bowler puts it this way, Like Abraham being shown the stars in the sky that will outnumber his offspring, or God declaring creation good, or Jesus declaring the mighty reversal of the kingdom of God, we are given a portrait of the work God is doing in the world, but we don't fully get to experience it. Jesus came to be with us and to work toward the restoration of the world. We see glimpses of peace, healing, grace, and goodness, but we still endure pain, suffering, and sorrow. This duality we must learn to live in as we wait for the day when God restores the whole world. Perhaps the hope we are trying to embrace this season is just this, learning to live while we wait. Advent, after all, is a season all about waiting, and it's all about learning to look for those breadcrumbs that hope scatters around us. Hope is the little bits of beauty both in the past and in the present, in the now and in the not yet. Hope is recalling these Advent stories of angels bringing good tidings, of miraculous pregnancies, of prayers saying by hopeful parents that their children would be the one that the world needs, the one the world's been waiting for. So what are we to do in this place between the now and the not yet? Let's consider Paul's advice to the church of Thessalonica. Brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions we have taught you. So let us do just that. Stand firm. Even when hope feels hard, stand firm. Show up and look for the breadcrumbs of hope found in the Advent story. This place between the now and the not yet is not a place to be idle. It's a place that when hope feels hard, we lean on the words, the prayers, and the traditions that have carried the church through generations. Just today, we have seen some bold and beautiful traditions of our church. Today, we welcome two new members of the church, remembering the other families who've joined this fall. Those joining the church today are joining a community who are hoping for a future that is full of God's promises. And not only are we hoping for this to come, but we together have all just now re renewed our vows to join in this work together to bring about God's plan for the future. We are pulling that not yet closer, making earth more as it is in heaven. In just a short while, we will celebrate Holy Communion, another beautiful tradition of the church. In communion, we remember and we tell the story again of all that has happened and God's big activity in the world, starting at the very beginning as God breathed that breath of life into the world. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and we remember the ongoing movement of the Holy Spirit present with us at that table, at this kneeling rail, all around us. In the traditional liturgy, we look both backwards and forwards as we proclaim our desire to be one with God one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. This is our ultimate hope. This is our good hope, our certain hope, that one day things will be as they should be. But for now, hope can be a tricky thing. Hope is the beauty we see in our past 
and our future, in our now and our not yet. If hope is a difficult thing for you this season, may you still find beauty breaking through the darkness of the world as we look to the future with good hope. Amen.